Hey everybody, this is Janet Fouts coming to you from Mindful Social, and this week with me is Christine Clifton. She's the author of You Don't Have to Shout to Stand Out, and I love Christine's book. I've been reading it, and I've been making notes, and you know, she is also an introvert, fellow introverts unite, and uh, Christine, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and what the uh, motivation was behind the book? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. I am all about the power of human connection. And as great as technology is, I feel like it's pushing us behind screens of all sizes and causing our conversation muscles to atrophy a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I find that a great medium that everyone can use and it doesn't cost a cent is conversation. That's how we can stay connected as humans. So everything that I do is conjunction with making connections. I tend to specialize in working with service-based entrepreneurs. My specialty is solopreneurs, the ones that are spinning five plates at once and need to not only do the work but also market and sell the work. And what I work with them on is the art of the conversation conversion when they are marketing in person and the science of their marketing systems so that they're integrated in a way where they are efficiently and effectively filling that eternal starving pipeline <laughs> <laughs> of leads and opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. um, and in the middle of all that is around staying true to you as a person. We're introverts, so whatever that means for us and how we choose to show up or whatever venues we choose to show up or not, I talk about that a little bit at the end of the book, and that when we can do that, we can show up comfortable, which then enables our confidence about our specialty to more naturally come through. So that's the whole little package of, of what I do. So I'm a coach, consultant, teacher, mentor, um, you know, pat on the back or kick in the tusher, whatever. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm a collaborative rainmaker with them because I can help them ideate beyond their own little sphere of their operation or their world and um, help them really facilitate the brilliance within them and then choose the right places to take that brilliance so that it works the best for them. Wow. <laughs> All great skills for a coach, clearly. When you say technology is ca causing conversations to atrophy, um, you, you actually have a method around the conversation. Can you talk a little bit about how we can get ready for a conversation? Yeah, and introverts and extroverts approach this differently. <laughs> and, and, and before I clarify, too, I want to say that my belief system is that there's a spectrum of introversion and extroversion. So I don't believe there's three types, extrovert, introvert, and ambivert. I think that there are, you know, spec, there's a spectrum. And so getting ready for a conversation, I think in a mindful way, obviously my business is called Mindful Business Matters and your book is called Mindful Social Marketing. So we're, we're like-minded for, for that. So I think mindfulness is, our, is what we're looking to do, which for me is a purposeful approach to really choosing to connect with that person. For me, that's what the definition of marketing really is, is connection. And I think we've lost that a little bit with all the noise in the marketplaces that we go. And so getting ready for a conversation is about really understanding who you're going to be talking with, what their pain or circumstance or needs might be, and then evoking some connections or resources on their behalf during that conversation. Now, if we're talking in terms of, you know, that lead funnel that, um, that we mentioned earlier, one of the other things that I do with uh, my clients, and by the way, I also have a great Facebook group where right now we're doing a networking challenge, a coffee networking challenge, where I'm helping them open up their scope of what a one-on-one -on -one means. 
So it could just be a reconnection to someone that you've been meaning to catch up with. It could be that dusty business card sitting on the corner of your desk from two months ago. And it could be the person you met just today that you felt a real kindred spirit connection with. So depending on the approach you take, I think can really open up the platform for the meeting or the conversation to take place. And we all hear that givers gain. I think that when we take that approach with any connection, whether we feel they might be a future client for us or not, that people begin to see our true selves, that we really are looking to start a relationship, not just make a sale. Yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely crucial that there's more to it than making a sale. You know, I'm always pleasantly surprised that I may send out a tweet or I have, I have a lot of people that I know through social media that I've never physically met, but they often pick up the phone and just call me kind of out of the blue and it blows me away every time. And I've tried to emulate that and, you know, reach out to people and, and actually talk to them more. And I have to say, Zoom has been a really good product for that because it's very easy to just go, hey, let's, let's pick up a conversation and it's video so that we have a better connection with what the other person is saying. We can see their facial expressions. Are they listening? Are they actually answering their email? You know, those little things that make it really important. <laughs> yes, um, I agree. But it's courageous to do that as well for those of us who are introverts. Uh, how do you decide? How, what's, what's the process to, okay, I'm... Do you set yourself a timeline every day? I'm going to reach out to so many people. What do you do? What's your process? You know, mine is an internal process. And the internal process is a mixture of inspired action and the actions I know I need to take as a business owner. And so I'll look at the people that I want to reach out to or are considering reaching out to and I sense what resonates in terms of who I really want to reach out to. And that could be in conjunction for no, with no reason at all or with a follow-up that we've been meaning to have or a conversation we've been meaning to have. As an introvert, I tend to like to warm the waters no matter what the connection is. And so even my mom once said, it's frustrating that I have to make an appointment with my daughter to talk with her. And, and I said, Mom, I make appointments with everybody because I kind of want to know. Now, I realize that not everyone operates that way. And some people, often more introverts or extroverts than others, are more than willing to receive a phone call out of the blue. And so I think as introverts, it's in, important for us to realize not everyone's like us. Not everyone needs a warning. Uh, but I do tend to, to operate that way. So I'll send somebody an email ping or a text ping, whichever the appropriate thing might be. Um, and the other thing that I do is often, especially as independent contractors or self-employed or entrepreneurs, we tend to feel a little more personal about a call, especially if it, as it relates to a lead or a prospect, and we really don't want to be salesy or icky in our approach. Never be icky. Right? Never be <laughs> icky. I think that's the title of my next book, Never Be Icky, Sales <laughs> Conversations for Introverts, um, is that when I can reframe that to, to really remembering that I am a solution to many people's problems or pains and that all I have to do is ask some questions to find out if there's even an opportunity for that kind of connection. So I take a moment before I'll pick up that hundred pound phone and, <laughs> and say, um, you know, what, how can I be a resource to this person? Instead of saying, how can I sell them something, you know, that I am, you know, offering today. So that's really how I do it. And when I call, I make sure they know who I am, obviously, and why I'm calling. And I love the permission approach when I make phone calls as well. So if they aren't expecting my call, I'll simply say, I've been meaning to catch up with you since we met two months ago at the XYZ event. I know you weren't expecting my call. And I'm wondering if you have a minute to set something up where we can talk later. 
Mm-hmm. And what they'll do is they'll say, oh, I can talk now. And that might be cool, you know, for you as well. It may not be. And you might say, no, I'm busy today, but let's schedule something. Um, you know, or you could go ahead and schedule something. So when you use that kind of permission approach, do you have a minute to talk now? Then people are much more willing to, to step in. What they hate is getting the telemarketer calls that dive right into the sales pitch. Right. You know, so when we're not outputting, we're allowing the input. And that's why a question allows the input, even if it's a purpose permission uh, format for the conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when we when we get set up, we get the call. They've said, "Yeah, I got time right now," and and I try to do that too because you know we're all so busy. Uh, how do we structure a call to best effect? Because most people have about ten minutes. Yeah. Max. Yeah. Exactly, Max. So the follow-up conversation I might have is, do you have a minute, you know, how much time do you have now? So I know what I have to work with and they'll give me what they're willing, and you know, to give me. And no matter what time frame they say, I'll automatically, in my mind's eye, just split it into thirds. And what I'll say is, well, the way I like to have these calls is that I'd like to find out a little bit more about you and what you do. I'd like to share a little bit about what I do. And then at the end, we'll see if we have any resources to share with each other. How does that sound? Mm. And now that model is in the book. It's called the ASK, A-S-K model, which is an acronym. And it's acknowledge, state, and then know by asking a question. So I'm acknowledging what we're here to do. I'm stating my desired outcome of the, the, the structure or architecture of the call. But then I'm asking a question. How does that sound? And what's interesting is most people are as relieved as I am to know that there's some structure to it, right? Mm-hmm. So that tends to be the unknown about phone conversations, especially ones that aren't scheduled, is we have no idea how it's going to go. And the anxiety of that can play on us. So when we own the conversation like a mini meeting and help people understand that it's going to be this, this, and that, then people are like, wow, like who would turn that down? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's interesting because often when you have those kind of off-the-cuff calls, you take half the call trying to set up that structure because you're kind of like, okay, why is she calling me? What does she want? You know, you've got all of these things in your head and you're, you're waiting for the cell, you know, it's, it's so much better to have some kind of structure. And, and I, I love that ask formula idea because it makes it easier for us too to be able to say, okay, now, you know, I know what my path is going to be. And, you know, you can kind of set up the conversation so that you know how you're going to transition between those things. Because transitions aren't easy on calls, um, especially with somebody like me who tends to talk a lot. So, you know, how do you, um, how are you finding that that works? Do you find that people stick to that structure or do they jump right out of the box off the bat? Most of the time they stick with it. Mm. I don't think I've, there are some times when I have to remind somebody about the end of the time we might have together. Sometimes it's extroverts, but but not always. I mean, you and I both know that introverts can yak up a storm one-on-one, you know, so, so it's not just extroverts, but uh, sometimes people wander off in the conversation and I'll try to rein that back in. I'll say something like, well, with the time we have right now, maybe I'll take some time to tell you about me. Or uh, if I stop asking questions, I mean, like you, I think you're a very curious person about people in general, as am I. So we tend to pepper the other person with questions, which makes them talk more. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn sometimes we can slow it down so that they can come back and, and either offer, you know, so tell me about you or we slow it down to say, uh, so I'm happy to hear about you and what would you like to know about me could be one way to transition or um, what questions do you have about what I do is another way to, to do it, which doesn't um, 
you know, so we have to find what feels right for us. Yet the transition is important because as givers, we will tend to give the entire conversation away to the other person. Mm -hmm. And it helps them to the nth degree, doesn't always help our onboarding of prospective leads, you know, into our business when we're giving away the store. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the ask model and the meeting model are two different things that are at play with what we're talking about. Works with any type of style because the extroverts get tightened in a little bit you know, reined in a little bit, and the introverts tend to be able to expand out a little bit because they know what the format is. So it, I think that's the secret sauce of the mm -hmm. ask model and the meeting model, the mini meeting model, because there is a blueprint and everybody knows what that we're singing from the same songbook. And so find people who really respect it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. I'll have to practice more. <laughs> it's all about practice. It really is. everything? <laughs> it is. You know, it's a learnable skill, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we can't do it in our heads. Uh, introverts have a very lively head inside. And uh, practice gets it over the lips and out there. And f so find a buddy. You know, find a buddy to practice the ask model with. Or warn a friend that you're going to practice a new technique when you call them next. Or... Yeah. You know, find a way where you can practice in and get it across the lips because once you do, I'm all about flow. I think my life purpose is really about enabling flow as a whole. Mm -hmm. And my medium of choice tends to be the spoken word. That's mm -hmm. just what has become my, my life's work. Mm -hmm. And so it's about enabling flow of the conversation. That's great. <laughs> but it isn't all about speaking though um you talk in the book a lot about one of my favorite topics is active listening so how do we be effective listeners and let's say for the sake of argument that it is a face-to-face -face conversation which may be easier to listen than on the phone sure yeah so for face-to-face -face, i as a former hr chick in 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 a traditional role for let's say 11 years and in traditional management positions for a total of 20, which is inclusive of, of the HR role, I've been to so many communication workshops and that type of thing where they teach this active listening like to nod your head and to say, mm-hmm, and to repeat back. <laughs> And I actually guide people, right, you're chuckling, mm -hmm. in my book to, to scale back on that a little bit because it literally uses the same communication in our brain space to do those things as it does to listen. So we're missing things. And in a in-person conversation, while I am a bit intuitive about body language and things like that, I'm not schooled in NLP or body language. So I am more about being a big satellite dish when I'm talking to someone. So I want to really observe their energy level and I want to really listen to what they say is important to them. So if somebody is talking about their to-do lists and being bogged down in tasks, then no matter what their style is, their pain in that moment is organization, you know, prioritization. That's what they're communicating to me is a very pragmatic and practical desire or need. Mm -hmm. And I can then speak back in that language so that I can better help or serve them, whether it be connecting them to a resource or giving them a tip or a trick, you know, to try. If they're talking more around the fact that all of that stuff is causing them not to spend time with their family or they're not making the connections that they really want to be making with other people, that speaks to a relational, I call it decision-making motivator. So I'm going to speak to that. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to speak to, well, if you could get on top of all of that and spend more time with your, making those relationships stronger within your family and your network, right? Because when we speak in that language, then they're going to hear us because we've heard them. Mm -hmm. And by listening and being that satellite dish, instead of filling the space with all the things that we've traditionally been taught in terms of active listening, 
which could cause us to miss those key factors. Mm. And that's what I would do. Yeah, is is the and the energy level too. As introverts, we're very thoughtful often. We're internal energy driven. We tend to be a little bit more quiet with our consideration of what's being said. And not everyone reads that accurately. They'll read it, or I would say misread it, as disinterest or not being excited or passionate or whatever the case might be. So if I am in person with someone who's highly demonstrative, I'm going to lift my energy a little bit so I can meet that person a little bit more where they are. Mm -hmm. And if they are a little more on the quiet side as I am, then I can sink back and, and rest in how I more naturally am. So those two factors is what I like to put into play is around listening to the what they're saying and speaking to that but also noticing energy level and doing our best to match it oh that's a really important thing with any conversation is trying to maintain you know some kind of equilibrium because if you know they're completely over the top and you're just sitting there obviously they're going to think you're bored and they're going to wander off you know to something else and also they're not going to listen to you because now, you know, you've kind of tripped that trigger and, and it's not going to be a conversation. <laughs> yeah, that often happens. And one of the statistics I share in my book is that our listening bandwidth is three times larger than our ability, than a person speaks. So when someone's speaking to us, we have three times more space bandwidth to take on more. So if we aren't if we aren't engaging them, they're doing their grocery list, they're thinking about their next meeting, they're thinking about what they wanna say next. And, and by using these other methods, it's a little, it's just a technique to keep people more present mm -hmm. and listening because they feel heard and you're speaking specifically to what they've said. Where often when I meet with people who don't know these techniques, they're just espousing everything that they do instead of listening to me and picking maybe one thing that might be appropriate. And so I feel overwhelmed, especially as an introvert often. So this technique helps kind of sort the wheat from the chaff, at least in that one conversation, so that you can speak to the thing that feels most important to the other person. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about having conversations and these, I like the idea in the book of, of mini meetings that you really put a structure into the conversation. So how does that work when you have to go to the dreaded networking meeting? <laughs> and, and have to answer that dreaded question, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So networking, we have likely less time for that conversation because there's an understanding in the culture networking is that you tend to get around to more people than if you were um, at a coffee with one person obviously so it just the meeting meeting just gets reduced in size but the structure remains the same yeah. so if you feel like you're gonna spend five minutes with each person that you meet, which is probably reasonable in, net, in a networking event, maybe three minutes if you're Speedy Gonzalez. That's not me, by the way. I'm not Speedy Gonzalez. But whatever time you think, just split it up. Make sure that you find out about them first. That's my you know, secret you know, formula. Because then when you hear them speak and you ask them a question, then you can choose what you say really specifically specifically for that second part of the mini meeting mm -hmm. and then in the third part of the meeting is when you might decide whether you want to talk to this person again. Now I happen to have a time trade account where I will tell people or I'll email them if they if I'd like to talk to them again and I'll say hey I'd like to talk to you more but I know that you want to get around to other people here networking why don't we hop on the phone for virtual coffee sometime in the next week or so? Hmm. Would you like to do that? And that's the ask model. Acknowledge, I know you want to get around to other people. I would like to speak to you further. State your desired outcome. Would you like to do that? Because when they say yes, then 
you say, okay, great, I will email you a link to log yourself into my automated calendar. It eliminates all that back and forth on email, mm -hmm. trying to find a time. And if something doesn't work for you, just let me know, okay? And people are like, brilliant, right? Um, so the ask model works for that too. And you have to be ready for a place to take them if you want to take them further. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I block out Monday afternoons for virtual coffees. And so I can tell people pretty easily, I usually meet virtual coffee on Monday afternoons. Could that work for you mm -hmm. as part of my, my networking conversation? So they have that framework for when the invitation might happen. So you have to be ready. I call it the catcher's mitt in your business. You have to have the catcher's mitt to kind of catch them in those different areas of your business for that quick networking conversation and connection to happen. And if you didn't feel a connection or kindred spirit with them, then that's fine too. You just say, I'm great to meet you. I wish you all the best. You know, enjoy your time here today. And mm -hmm. then you're off to the, ne off to the next person. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage at a networking event when you're talking to someone, um, you've got your structure going and you started, you know, as soon as they get done talking about themselves, then they start looking around the room. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm know. Yeah. It, that's interesting, isn't it? And I feel like, Gosh, networking is sometimes like bad dating or bad speed <laughs> dating, right? And that happens is like they're looking for the next person. I am a big fan of purpose permission as a technique for conversation. Mm -hmm. So if I were to see that, I would say, um, oh, would you like to get around to some other people now? Move right? along. <laughs> right or you know I but I always let them <clears throat> back like that mm -hmm. is, I think is my skill of my my secret formula technique is enabling flow by letting them decide mm -hmm. and I might say yeah I see John I need to get over to him and then you still have a chance if you want to talk with them further to say that but if not you just say go right ahead you know it was nice to meet you <laughs> and then you're off the hook, so to speak, and on to the next thing. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's really, it's always a challenge for me at networking events. You know, I mean, I can go and speak at a public event and be fine if people come to talk to me afterwards. That's great. I love to talk to them. Don't make me go to the wine and cheese afterwards. Just don't make me go. It's so painful. And, and it's funny because I... Uh, you know, you do get into that mode where you're putting up a wall before you're even, you're, you're almost unapproachable because it's very clear that you don't want to be there. So yeah. do you have any tricks? I do. I bet it's structured too, isn't it? <laughs> well, a little bit. You know, I am Virgo and I think this is where my love of structure comes and mm. Virgos are known for organization and um, you know, prioritization, but I also believe in flexibility. I'm a mindful person myself. I believe in the law of attraction, the secret, you know, what you think about, you bring about. And I love to infuse all of this with those principles as well. So that's actually going to be my tip. Um, what I would say is if there's a wine and cheese, right, attached to your next speaking engagement, that you take a moment to just breathe after you speak and before you go in and set your own kind of resonance or frequency for what you'd like to meet or speak with when you step into the wine and cheese. And so we tend to feel like there's a social obligation to behave in a a particular way at those things. So my invitation is to center sense for yourself the resonance and sometimes I'll just say thanks universe for sending me the right person to talk with <laughs> or the person that needs to talk with me and I'll walk in and I won't approach anyone I'll walk in I'll go get my wine I know that I'm kind of vibrating at that frequency and I kind of just wait and see what happens mm -hmm. or if the host is there I might go and thank the host 
And so I think some of it for us, especially as introverts, is that we have a, sometimes we believe that people are watching us and <laughs> kind of judging our behavior. And that mm -hmm. is, could be true. I tend to think more, I would rather show up in my authentic suit so that I have the energy, motivation, and resource to give to people. Mm -hmm. So I have to fill my cup first. And that's a little bit of how I would suggest you try and do it. If you're going, I've told some of my clients to stop networking. Wow. And one of them is a strong introvert. And she simply doesn't show up confident at large networking events. Mm -hmm. And so the model that I like to structure for them is to have that first entry point. I call it the no like trust system. So it's not just no like trust one person. It's what instances do you have set up in your business where people get to know you, then get to like you, and then get to trust you. So for her to get to know her, we have set up classes and meditations as her first point of contact for people. So that so she invites people into classes and meditations as the first place. She's strong. She knows her stuff. She's going to deliver those classes and meditations in a very confident way. So that's her first entry point into her business. Another client, her target market are owners of small companies. Chances are they're not out networking. They're at galas, they're at fundraisers, mm -hmm. right? They're at places like this, golf courses. So I've told her that and if she wants to make the most of her time that she'd be better off sponsoring at a gala or buying a table at a gala and inviting the people she wants to mix and mingle with. Um, so these are other ways we can think about alternatives to networking. Maybe that's my next book. <laughs> now you've got three already. <laughs> so, but in your case where you, you talk about mm -hmm. speaking, that's also my primary marketing channel. I love to speak. I love to teach. Mm -hmm. And um, I've found that when I do that and I set that intention, then the right people come up to me afterwards to chat. I get the kind of of leads that I really would like from that kind of time investment as long as I'm setting my vibration in the right place yeah yeah well and I, I love that that you know before you go into anything honestly but especially into an event like that yeah taking a breath getting centered setting your intentions so that you walk in with that intention rather than going oh god I hate it here I know it no in it's really interesting to watch other introverts in the room too, which is one of the techniques that I use is I will look around the room and find the wallflowers and head straight for them because they're going to be really glad to see me. Yeah. Once you get a conversation going, you know, it can build from there. So I, I love that technique as well. Yeah. Yeah. I also love the, um, the wing man or wing woman, <laughs> right? So call a friend, phone a friend and say, Hey, I'm going networking. Would you like to go together? Mm -hmm. Why not? You and got you my back. I got yours. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 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 So set your, my, one of my clients gave me the words for what I was doing with him. And he goes, I'm getting really clear, Christine, that I'm to set up the best conditions for my own success. Mm. That I couldn't have said it better than that. And that's what we're talking about. So whether you're extrovert or an introvert or anything in between, really honor your own natural style with how you want to be when you network. And know that networking doesn't just mean going to large events. Mm -hmm. Coffee networking, like I'm doing with my Facebook group, is inviting people to have coffee. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways to network. It isn't just, I call, I say that networking isn't a place you go. It's something that you do. And when we can reframe that a little bit, we can better say, all right, <sighs> I like coffees better <laughs> than big networking events. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or as introverts, we might tend to prefer a vendor table at those big events. So people are coming to us. Mm -hmm. So do that. You know, there are multiple right answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because you really can 
you know, depending on, on where you are at in the moment, you can really structure things for your own success. I like that. That's right. Yeah. Well, Christine, it's been wonderful speaking to you, and I, I've learned a lot. I hope all the other introverts out there and the introverts, <laughs> too, have learned some things. And I would like you to let people know where they can find you and, obviously, how they can get the book. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll give you the book website first. It's noshoutstandout.com, which then has a link over to Amazon to go grab the book in Kindle or in paperback. And either version gives you some really cool bonus worksheets that enhance the learning of each of the chapters. And I loved putting those worksheets together because it really is about the practice that we talked about before. And the other thing I want to offer your listeners and your blog readers is an opportunity to have a networking laser call with me. Wow. They can go to, <laughs> you know, let me help you if you're stuck or need a reframe. I'm happy to do that about 15 minutes or so and just go to chatwithchristine.com and book right into my time trade. I'd be happy to, to talk you through what you're facing right now. Uh, my business website is mindfulbusinessmatters.com, and you can always just email me if you want, and I can also direct you to that Facebook group that I've referenced, which is also called You Don't Have to Shout to Stand Out on Facebook, mm -hmm. where we're doing the coffee networking challenge this month, but we're going to be taking on different opportunities for con conversations with people uh, moving forward. This was just one little way that we could focus on the book topics for the month of March. So join me. I'd be happy to have you. Oh, that's so great. And thank you so much for making that offer. I think that a lot of people can use it. Again, uh, you know, the book is You Don't Have to Shout, Stand Out. And I really enjoyed it. Um, Introverts Unite. Oh, yes. I'm with you. <laughs> so thank you, Christine. You're welcome.